Namaste. Today I'm going to talk about kapha constitution or kapha dosha in Ayurveda. We all have multiple aspects within us, but sometimes we're higher, uh, a person may be higher in a certain dosha. So earth and water make up the kapha constitution. Think about earth. Earth and water are the most dense of the elements. They're the most dense, they're the most heavy. Um, earth, for example, and water are also cool. Think about when you're gardening and you're planting your garden and you put your hand deep down into the earth. When you get really into the earth, you feel that it's cool, that it's moist, that it has that density, there's a certain unctuousness to the earth. Um, the kapha type, because it's also with a water, earth and water, is very smooth. So we call that unctuous or smooth or rich. Um, people who are of the kapha dosha may be a little bit heavier set and have shorter, denser uh, joints and, and skeletal structures. Um, they also often tend to have a very smooth, unctuous skin, as opposed to the more rough, dry skin that a vata constitution might have, or the oilier skin that a pitta constitution may have. So uh, the earth types, they have beautiful skin and uh, often very blemish-free, and their eyes are large and lustrous. So there are some beautiful aspects to the kapha dosha, um, even more so in the personality. Kapha types are very stable, family-oriented, and grounded. They make great loyal friends because they don't like change, so they're very sort of loyal to the end. They're also um, extremely trustworthy and great listeners. So. Often with the, uh, the types, you can see that it'd be wonderful to match up the types. If a, a vata person may be more talkative and, a, and, and like uh, sort of a lot of dyna, dynamism and change, but they really crave those friendships with people who are quite grounded and stable and good listeners. Um, whereas the kaphas could benefit from vata friends because vatas are very motivated and uplifting. So one aspect of kapha, though they're great friends and great listeners and very uh, generally quite happy, there is a heavier aspect that can set in this kind of inertia where if they become sluggish and slow and kind of heavy, if they go more towards that density of kapha, um, they can become down and also they can become too inactive. So they need that motivation in their lives to become a little bit more active. So that's a little bit about the kapha type. Their vital essence that they have, the rarefied essence that they're very rich in is ojas. I mention that a lot because ojas is actually very important. In yoga, we tend to mention prana a lot, and we're, we're importing prana through the pranayamas. And that may be because in India, we see it's a very stable society that's had a long history and a very long, stable cultural tradition. So it's a kapha situation. There's a predominance of kapha. There's a strong sense of family, a strong sense of tribe. So in the situation where we find a lot of kapha, yoga appeared and yoga was bringing in a lot of pranayama techniques. Why? Because pranayama imports prana to get that kapha moving, to energize and stimulate and clarify the kapha. So a lot of yoga technology is great for, uh, for pacifying kapha. 
Um, and for Vata, we have to really look a little bit more carefully and use our knowledge of Ayurveda to, to use yoga technology very skillfully. But many of the uh, yoga techniques, asana and pranayama, are very good for importing prana to the kapha person who can then stabilize that prana through their ojas, through their natural continence. So ojas is that which contains. It's that which gives the protective layer to the, uh, to the aura. It's that which gives the uh, sort of unctuousness and the suppleness to the tissues, um, but also helps to contain prana on an energetic level. So stabilizes the channels of the nadis, uh, the subtle nerves that act through the body. So while the kapha are very rich and stable in terms of their nervous systems and in terms of their energetic system, if they get a bit sluggish, they'll need to import that prana or that tejas, that fire, uh, that are more common in the vata and the pitta types. So this brings me to this accumulation sites in the body. So for kapha, the accumulation of kapha or phlegm in the body is usually in the lungs and in the sinus. So also we'll see that practices like jalneti are excellent. Uh, Jal kapalabhati and dhoti, where you swallow the cloth and it goes all the way down sort of through the esophagus and you, receive, you remove phlegm from the stomach and also from the esophagus and the sutra neti, where you insert a thread in through the nostril. This is excellent for clearing out the sinuses, for clearing out phlegm. So again, a lot of the satkarmas, the cleansing techniques, are excellent for removing phlegm or removing the propensity of kapha. So in the physical body, phlegm accumulates more in the upper body, um, whereas in terms of the chakras, in terms of the energetic body, that grounding stability is found in the root chakra and then in the water chakra um, at the sacral center. So just like the vata, the physical site of accumulation and the energetic site of uh, richness is the opposite, at the opposite pole. So what else can we say about kapha? Um, I've talked a little bit about cleansing, a little bit about pranayama. So these techniques are all excellent. If the kapha person can maintain a little bit of that movement, a little bit of that motivation, they have the most stamina of all three of the doshas. So they have great continuing power if only they can keep that level of motivation high. Um, what about foods and oils for them? So in terms of oiling, because kapha is already naturally very unctuous, we don't necessarily need to apply oils for that, but um, we can use oils that are invigorating. So a mustard oil, for example, um, mustard oil in the area of the chest to bring up a little bit the, um, the fire, the clarifying aspect is wonderful for kapha. Also, clarifying herbs, herbs that are really going to cut through, through that phlegm. Because kapha is also cool, we'll think uh, things like ginger. Ginger is warming, but it's also clarifying and it's antibacterial. So if a kapha person was going to eat a kapha food. So again, kapha foods are that which are already sort of um, oily, rich, dense, creamy, pale in color, like milk. They would need to add something that's going to sort of dynamize that milk, give it a bit more of a kind of a fiery, energetic, clarifying quality. So warming the milk, absolutely for sure but also adding a bit of ginger to the milk is going to make it much more palatable for kapha and just in general they're going to have to moderate their intake of rich creamy foods because that's just going to add sort of more density to their diet and they're the dosha that can put on weight the most easily 
So things like cheese and other things will have to be eaten in moderation. Um, but clarifying light things, vata foods like salads um, and um, uh, other sort of uh, clarifying herbs like uh, mustard greens, uh, anything that's sort of bitter in flavor or astringent in flavor, these are going to be very clarifying for the kapha. If any phlegm goes into the stomach, it's going to be clarifying, but also it's light foods, so it's going to really cut that kapha. Um, other, other things that are um, antiviral and antibacterial that would be great for the kapha type would be turmeric. So often using turmeric in the milk is something that's um, very clarifying. Ah, so kapha are naturally quite devotional. And so devotional practices come naturally to them. And devotional practices build up that ojas, build up the continents. They're also naturally very um, allowing and surrendering. So as I mentioned, we have to keep up a little bit more the discipline. Um, if they get into a routine, they have that stamina to keep that routine going. It's just instituting a little bit more of the discipline of pitta to the kapha person. So having a yoga routine, they naturally need less sleep, but may like to take more. Because of their stamina, they need less sleep. So getting up earlier, doing a warming asana practice, uh, for example, the sun salutation is absolutely ideal. You're importing that solar energy, the warm fluid energy um, to help to keep them flexible and and limber with the uh, their tendency to be um, slightly of uh, uh, shorter skeletal structure having that fluid aspect to the asanas is warming and is great for them physically heat is very purifying of course and very clarifying um, there are also many um, solar breathing techniques or warming breathing techniques that are good for the respiratory system so Kapalabhati, automatically, it's a cleansing and a breathing. So that's going to be fantastic. Bastrika, in the area of the lungs. Again, it's a bit giving a bit of more drying, clarifying energy. Even Ujjayi Pranayam is warming in nature. So many of our techniques in the yogic repertoire are excellent for uh, Kapha. Um, since they're naturally devotional, um, they'll be naturally drawn to these techniques, but we can try to add techniques for a little bit more of that solar focus. So again, Trataka on a candle, in this case, would be excellent for them. And even with skill and with a teacher, at early dawn and su late sunset, solar gazing can be excellent for giving that solar energy, that dynamism to the kapha type. I hope this gives you a bit of an idea about how to support the kapha, but also the great attributes of the kapha constitution within um, yoga and within the realm of the devotional practice um, and as a stable force in society. Namaste.